Lord, there's so many reasons to uh, praise You this morning. Lord, no matter what season we are going through, we are thankful, Lord, that at the end of the day, we know we have a refuge. We have hope because of Jesus. Lord, I want to say thank You this morning for protecting Sarah and her family. Lord, thank You for the wisdom that You've given them as young parents in the way that they are able to turn their children's attention to Jesus and to truth. Lord, thank you for already schooling us this morning. As we've listened to that testimony and as we've sung these songs, Lord, as we've worshiped you through them, Lord, you've been schooling our hearts to say, don't look down, look up. Look to Jesus. And Lord, even at the the beginning of this uh, preach I'm about to do, God, I pray that you'll draw near to people whose hearts are really low today. Lord, even although we know you coming to us in those difficult times, like Sarah said, Lord, there's still a process to all of this. Lord, there are days when you need to speak to hearts again, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll do that for Sarah and them, that you'll do that for anybody watching and anybody in the room, that you'll help us, help us to put our eyes on Jesus, not on our circumstances. Comfort hearts this morning, I ask, Lord. Draw near, because that's what you do. We ask for that in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. So good to be with you. Welcome to everybody that's joining us online and welcome to uh, the group of people that are here in the room. It's so good to see you. Thank you for coming. You can take your seats. And Sarah, thank you so much just for being so brave to share that story. And thank you for encouraging us as God's people to do likewise in whatever circumstance that we might be uh, facing just want to say well done. Well done for not just focusing on the circumstance, but looking to Jesus. You did the right thing. And we pray that God will bring complete healing um, to your guys' hearts. I was watching a, a video the other day, and it was a video of this elephant that was beginning to walk. And uh, not too different from children that are, are, are getting to that time when they're about to walk. This elephant was stumbling all over the place. And it made me think about us as parents. Those of us who are parents uh, might uh, remember the days when that little baby that one moment was just lying on their back, all of a sudden turned onto their stomach. Maybe they turned without you uh, knowing they were gonna do that and off the bed they went. They've survived to tell the story. Are there any in the audience that have done that? Can put your hands up? Yes, rolled off the bed. I'm so glad it wasn't just us and that we're not just sucky parents. Um, but, uh, you know, I just thought about uh, these, these children and these little ones. They turn onto their stomach and then you begin to put them onto the, uh, onto the floor and uh, they try to move, kick with their legs, but really all they do is just slide around the floor because they haven't recognized that they've got to put their hands up to begin to crawl. But then that day comes. That day comes when they get onto their knees and sometimes they fall asleep with their knees still uh, uh, up underneath them. Then they get up onto their knees and their hands and they, they, they give you this kind of like excited look, this excited look like I've done it, but now what? You just see kind of like the panic and then they begin to rock and then they begin to crawl and then they come and st- uh, crawl up to your leg and then they venture up to stand next to your leg and then uh, all of a sudden they're leaning against um, some other things that aren't as firm as a person standing and it falls over and there's lots of tears. And then there's the big day, the big day when they, they take their first steps. It's a great day for parents. It's a day that parents look forward to, uh, to as uh, that little one gets close to that day. But can I tell you that as parents or as, and as a parent, the one thing that I am incredibly grateful for is that there are many uh, hope moments en route to them actually walking. We're looking out for them. Will they begin to crawl? Will they get their spatial perception right? Those hope moments 
are fantastic. And we're starting a new series today. Simon spoke about it, Hope Story. And what I want us uh, to do this, this morning, I feel as God uh, is speaking to us, is this. When we think about Hope Story, we need to be like those parents. We need to be like those parents that are looking forward to the day when we will meet Jesus face to face. And we're living our lives in view of that day. But at the same time, I believe that God is saying He wants us to be expectant for many hope moments along the way. We're not just living for that day. God is wanting to bring hope into our stories on a daily basis. When we go into those difficult times and when we are not in difficult times. And so, so um, during this series, there's going to be a whole lot of people. On, on most Sundays, there's going to be more than one of us that is going to share from Scripture and how that Scripture brought hope to their hearts in a season of their lives. And I'm asking you not to miss any one of these uh, next couple of Sundays. If you're somebody that is needing hope and courage in your heart right now, then I want to encourage you to be there. If you feel like you've got hope and courage in your heart right now, I want to encourage you to be there because there might be some people in your world that you need to point um, in this direction so that they can hear about the hope and courage that comes in Jesus. And so that's my encouragement to you today. And so I'm going to start with a story and a passage of Scripture that's very dear to my heart. Um, It has seen me through, let me just calculate it now, uh, 30 years. This one passage and many others, obviously, but this one has stuck with me through many a difficult season. And I'm hoping that uh, this, this, this truth from God's Word is going to bring hope and courage to your heart as we look at it this morning. I was 19 years old. We were uh, visiting my mom that morning in Flora Clinic. She had cancer, and she was in a coma. We'd been on the Thursday to visit her, and she was speaking to us, but not on the Saturday morning. And so as a family, we gathered around her bed, and we rubbed her arm, tried to see and make her as comfortable as what she could be. We read scripture to her. We spoke to her. And some of the things that we said were a little bit different to normal. We said, like, Mom, we know you might want to fight, but if you're not keen to fight, we'll be okay if you just go to be with Jesus if he comes to take you home. That's a hard thing to say to a, to, to a mom that's lying in a sick bed. Our prayers changed because we prayed that morning. And our prayers changed. I wanted my mom to kind of reap some of the rewards of being a mom, seeing your children matriculate and go into varsity and graduate and meet their spouse and have grandkids and be at the wedding. I wanted my mom to experience all of those things. But on that Saturday morning, as we saw how she was uh, suffering, my prayer changed to, Lord, you know that we want you to heal, Mom. And Jesus, we know that you can. But if heaven is where you want to heal, Mom, then I pray that you will take her home and bring complete, complete healing there. I'm saying it a whole lot easier today because that day was... Uh, big lumps in my throat and lots of tears going down my eyes. We went home to go and have some of my lunch. And soon after we had lunch, my dad returned to the hospital. And it wasn't too long after that when my mom passed away. And my dad returned home to tell us. We were part of a church community. And uh, so many people came around to visit with us and pray with us. But I remember one older friend older friend prayed and then he read the passage of scripture that I'm going to be sharing with you today. It's a passage of scripture from 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3 to 11. And I'm going to start at the end because that's where this friend of mine started. Started at the end and it was incredibly helpful and I want to maybe just uh, say this before, before I get going. I didn't get all of this stuff that I'm going to talk about today on the day came in seed form, but I knew that Jesus was present to do the things that we're going to hear about today, and he proved to do just that. And so it wasn't a, hey, I'm sad, all of a sudden I'm happy. It was a journey. It's always a journey, but it's a journey that Jesus is with us in. So 2 Corinthians, I'm going to be reading from verse uh, 8 and 9, and then we'll go back to uh, the beginning part of this passage of Scripture. 
a little bit later. Verse 8, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we, were dis- so that we despised of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. First thing I want us to see this morning is that you can be real. You can be real with God, and it's really important to be real with people. Now, I know we can't be real with every single person, but it's important to be real with God, and it's important to be real with people. Caitlin mentioned it when she said, spoke about the SOS, speak. The last of the S's, speak to someone. You see, life wasn't, wasn't um, sunshine and roses for Paul right now, and he doesn't hide it. In fact, he says this. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed, fellow believers, fellow followers of Jesus. I don't want you to be uninformed about what we were going through. What we were going through was so great that they were under great pressure, felt like they had no ability to endure, and that they were despairing of life itself. Have you been there? I've been there on many occasions over my 49 years. It was so bad that it felt to Paul like a death sentence had been passed over his life and over the life of those that were traveling with him. But Paul wants us to see something in this passage. He wants us to see that when you go through difficult times, we are in good company. Sometimes we believe a lie like Sarah um, touched on. We don't believe the truth. Sometimes we believe the lie that God has abandoned. There must be something wrong with me. I want to say to you this morning, if you're going through a difficult season, you're in good company. You're in the company of Paul, you're in the company of Jesus, and you're in the company of many others who have followed Jesus over the years. Sometimes we think we've put our faith in Jesus and everything's going to be sunshine and roses, and something happens and we think, what is this about? What is this all about? I thought God had a good purpose and plan for my life, but it doesn't look like it. What can I tell you? If David had taken that approach, he would have never um, become king of Israel. With Saul chasing him down, he would have never become king of Israel with a thought this purpose is, uh, is never going to happen. So would Joseph had. He would have never anticipated that he would have been second in charge of the nation when he was thrown into that pit and then became a servant in part of his house and then went into prison. I want you to see that even those who obey Jesus, who pursue his purposes, go through difficult times. And Jesus wants you to see that this morning. That's why Paul has written this. He wants us to know that following Jesus does not exempt us from difficult seasons. But he wants us to know most definitely that that doesn't mean knowing that um, we go through difficult seasons doesn't mean that we can't be real with God and we can't be real with people. And so the first thing that we see in this passage is that you can be real. Next thing that I see in this passage is that you can rely on God. Verse 9 says this, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. Paul wants us to know that God can be relied on in our difficult season. When life is pressing in and the pressure seems too great and it feels so great that maybe you despair of life itself, Paul is saying that there is hope in Jesus and we can rely on him. In fact, the best thing that we can do is shift our reliance off of ourselves and onto him. That is what he would have us do. We should normally always be walking in that place. That should be our lifestyle. But sometimes when we go through a difficult season, that's when we realize I've got nothing of myself to rely on. I can only rely on Jesus. So shift your reliance onto Him. 
You know, I was so glad that this elderly friend of mine shared this with me. I'm so glad that he shared it with me because in the next couple of days and months, I would have many questions going on in my heart and in my mind. Questions like, God, was this some kind of a punishment? God, is there something wrong with my faith or our faith as a family? But because that friend had shared that we can be real with God and we can rely on God, I realized that there's not always something wrong with us. Most times there isn't. I realized that difficult times come to everyone. Even the passionate for Jesus and the obedient to Jesus. Don't get it confused. Don't let the enemy shipwreck your faith when a difficult time comes. Your house is built on the rock. His name is Jesus. And so I wanna encourage you, I wanna encourage you to, to look to him in those difficult times. Dispel the lies and know that you can be real with God, you can be real with people, and you can rely on God. But here's one of the challenges. I found that we can know these truths, know that we can be real with God, and sometimes we tell him exactly how we feel about the situation. Sometimes we can even rely on God, but sometimes we go into, we become Stoics. There's a danger in that. I'll tell you what a Stoic is if you don't know. Stoic is someone who endures pain and hardships without any complaining or emotion. Sometimes we can think to ourselves, we know we can rely on God. And so what are we gonna do? We're just gonna not let our emotions show because we can rely on God. He's bigger, he's sovereign, he's in control, and he absolutely is. He's all of those things, and we heard that even earlier on with, with Sarah. But I hope you noted that Sarah went a little bit farther, she, further, should I say. She took some time to hear her daughter's emotions. What was going on inside of there? We've got this truth, but what's going on inside of there? God doesn't want us to be stoic, doesn't want us to uh, grin and bear it. He doesn't want us to put on a happy face. He wants us to be real. And that brings me to the first part of this chapter. I want you to just think about the state that Paul was in, the sparing of life, great pressure. But when he starts off this passage, this is what he has to say, 2 Corinthians 1 verse three to five. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. See, Paul is not just telling us from this passage of Scripture that we can be real and that God can be relied on. He's telling us that God cares about our emotions. He cares about what we feel. He, 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 he's saying to us that God's comfort is real. And that's my third point for today. God's comfort is real. That is an amazing thing. God doesn't want us to just be so full of faith that we just deny what we're seeing in front of us. No, he wants us to be honest with what's in front of us, but he wants to come into that deep place of our hearts where we feel and where we need comfort. Isn't God amazing? It's incredible that the God of heaven would come so close to us to comfort. Verse three, it says that he is the father of compassion. When we read that, it doesn't mean he's like a father with compassion. It means that he is the source of compassion. Are you needing compassion today? There are many, many other wells that you can come to, try, to drink from, but there is one source of compassion, and his name is Jesus, sent by the Father who loved you and me. And so he's a God of compassion, but not only that, he's the God of not just some comfort, all comfort. I looked up that word. If you were part of our uh, online prayer time a few weeks ago, Munya touched on it as well. That word comfort means to come near, to console, encourage, and refresh. 
Are you needing some consoling today? Are you needing some encouragement? Are you needing to be refreshed after what you've been through in this last season? Maybe a season even long before COVID, but it's still dragging on. He's the God of all comfort. He's the God who comes near to console, to encourage, and to refresh. And he comforts us in all of our trouble. All of our trouble. You know, sometimes we think COVID, ah, COVID, comfort. Comfort is only for times when we have lost a loved one. But God is saying to us this morning that comfort is for all our trouble. I wonder what trouble you might be facing. Maybe you haven't lost a loved one. Maybe you're a dad and you've taken a salary cut and you're concerned for, the, for, for, for your family. Will you be able to make it through? Maybe you're a single mom and the same thing has happened to you and you're wondering what is going to happen to me and my family. Maybe you have lost a loved one. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe a dream has been shattered and you don't know whether that dream will ever come to fulfillment again. Will it happen? God is wanting to bring comfort to any kind of difficult season that we're going through. So don't fall into the trap that God's comfort is only for those who lose people. No, God's comfort is there for you as you face the struggles of life. He's wanting to draw near. He's wanting to console if consoling is what you need. He's wanting to encourage and he is wanting to refresh. Maybe you're just exhausted. Exhausted from doing life by yourself. You've still got a job, but you're at home and it's you only. You send reports back to the workplace, but you're feeling it. You're feeling it. God is wanting you to know his comfort, even today. I just wanna say that God's comfort is real. I have cried on many occasions over the years in many seasons, and God has always comforted. He's comforted when I've lost loved ones. He's comforted when I've lost friends. He's comforted when I've been retrenched. He's comforted when the family has faced some or other sickness. He's comforted when finances seem to uh, be under real strain. He has comforted. And I wanna say to you today that he wants to comfort you. How is he comforted? He's comforted by his presence, never leaves us, never forsakes us. He's comforted with scripture, like the one that I'm sharing today and many others. He's comforted through somebody who's just picked up the phone and sent a phone call, or in, as things have got more modern over the years, sent a voice note, praying for me or we as a family. It's come through, a pray, through prayers of friends. It's come through community like this. I wanna say to you, won't you allow God to comfort today? He wants to draw near. But I want you to notice this, the passage that we've just read. He wants to comfort you, but he's not wanting it to stop there. Because he says the comfort that you receive from him will be in a sense like a platform that will help you to, comf to comfort others in all of their trouble. The end of the road is not just comfort for you, but it's that you will be able to comfort others when they are in trouble. That's something precious, that we can know God's com comfort and that we can pass on God's comfort. Won't you take hold of that today if you're in a good space? Have you received comfort from the Lord? I'm sure you have. And you're in a good place? That's fantastic, I'm glad for you. But are there people around you that are facing terrible storms that you can bring comfort to because you've received comfort? Don't hold back. God is wanting to uh, work through your life in other people's lives. It's an opportunity for you to bring hope to them even, even as you have received hope. Essentially, that's what's happening today. 
an elder man was encouraged by a passage of scripture. And he took the time to encourage Vaughan, who had just lost his mom. And that same comfort that I received then and others along the way to today is gonna comfort you today. Not because I'm great, but because God is great. Because God is faithful to his word. He will take the most terrible seasons that we face and he can use them for good. And so God's comfort is real. Next point, prayer is no small thing. Verse 10 says this, on him we have set our hope, that's on Jesus, that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. See, the believers in Corinth knew that Paul and them were being persecuted. They knew that people had lost their lives. They had been martyred for their faith. And yet, what do they do? They pray. And Paul in this passage of Scripture says, your prayers brought hope to our hearts for God to deliver. Don't underestimate prayer. You praying to God, but can I encourage you to be a people who will pray for those who are in need? Because I'm telling you, hope will come to their hearts because God just does that. Hope and courage will come to their hearts when they know that somebody is praying for them. Don't underestimate, uh, underestimate prayer. Help others by praying for them. Do you hear that? Help others by praying for them. There are obviously practical things that a person can do too, but don't neglect to pray as well. I can just tell you that that's our story. People would phone, we didn't have cell phones in those days, they'd phone on the landline, they'd come over, they would pray for us. I don't know how we got over those early days, never mind the days beyond those early days. My sister had written her first matric exam on that Thursday when we went to visit my mom. I was about to go into second year varsity exams. We still wrote those exams, we passed those exams, and my sister did so well that she was still able to get some form of a bursary with those results. Are we great? I don't know how we got through. We had a memorial ahead of us. We had exams that are overwhelming at any uh, point in time, but matric exams just seemed to be this huge mountain. God saw us through. He strengthened us, he comforted us. Yes, there was still lots of crying to take place and there was lots of crying in those early days, of course but there was this sense of God upholding us with his mighty hand. And he wants to do that for you today. He wants to uphold you with his strong, righteous, mighty hand. And I can't explain it. It's not warm and fuzzies. The tears didn't just dry up. They were still there, but there was like an undergirding deep inside our hearts that God has got people around us praying for us and he's praying for us. Just a sidebar, when it comes to comfort, sometimes when we uh, are needing comfort, that obviously becomes the thing that we're looking for most. It's natural, nothing bad about it, and as I've said, God wants to give us his comfort. But I wanna just uh, say this, sometimes we can be so focused on uh, what we need that we don't uh, recognize how God wants to get that comfort to us. He can do it just by himself, and he does on many days. But I feel like uh, God wants to say and us to know the means he uses. He uses his word. He comforts us by his word. I just wanna ask, are you reading it? He comforts us by others' prayers. Does anybody else know what you're going through? Have you told someone? If for nothing else that they can just pray for you? He comforts through community, church community of his people who themselves have received comfort at times and are maybe strong today and can, and, and, and can uh, encourage those who are not so strong today. Church community is really important. And don't think to yourself, yes, it's only when we see each other face to face. Obviously, it's great. But community can still happen at a distance. 
I can't tell you how many um, prayer requests I've got over this season, and it feels like um, I'm just so grateful that we can still be a community that can stand by each other. So I want to encourage you, if you have prayer requests, we often say it, let us know. Um, a, a mail goes out uh, most weeks, and there's always something at the bottom. If you're needing prayer, message us at hello at citygodfirst.co.za. And if you've got one of our numbers, phone us. You're welcome to do that too, but let us know because we want to be praying. Next point is that praise is always possible. Praise is always possible. It's not easy, but it's always possible. Before I get into uh, this point completely, I want to just give some warnings though. Some warnings of some, some pitfalls that will either hinder your praise or draw you away from praise. And how can I tell you these pitfalls? Because I've experienced them myself. Pitfall number one is when we consider hardship as punishment and not discipline. Lorelei spoke so well about that last week, I would encourage you to go and listen to that Zephaniah preach. Hebrews 12 verse seven says this, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? That word discipline there does, does not mean um, punished. It means trained, shaped, discipled by their father. If we think about today's text in particular, God is saying that he uses hardship and when hardship comes, he just uses it. When hardship comes, he trains us to be a people who know God's comfort and then are able to comfort others. Next pitfall is that we become weary, but we don't wait. Weariness without waiting. Again, in Hebrews 12, verse 12, it says, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Now, bear in mind, Hebrews 12 is about hardship. That, that part of this passage is about hardship. And he's saying, strengthen your feeble arms. It's not wanting us to become so weary. Isaiah 40, verse 28 to 31 says this, Do, not, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Some translations say those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. What does that wait or hope mean? It means to look for, to hope in, to expect, to linger for, to look for the Lord, to hope in the Lord, to expect the Lord, to linger for the Lord. See, weariness when it's coupled to waiting is the way that will uh, lead us to a place where we're strengthened again. If we're weary and we wait, we will find strength. And the next pitfall is bitterness. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter, bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Bitterness is harshness, resentful towards others, maybe even resentful towards God. God doesn't want us to have a bitter root in our hearts when we go through a difficult time. The reality is we're probably gonna encounter one or all of these pitfalls. We might even stop at one of them. But I wanna say this, don't stay there. You might stop there, but don't stay there. I think of Paul, and the Bible says he's got a thorn in his flesh. And it says that he pleads with God three times to take this thorn away from him. 
I don't think that means that he prayed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and God didn't take it away. I think that this, when Paul pleaded, it was seasons of saying to God, God, will you take this from me? Will you remove this thorn in my flesh? But Paul didn't give up, despite, he was, despite facing this difficult time. And then we read those incredible words, and God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. I wanna encourage you to push through to grace, push through to truth, push through to Jesus. You might stop at a pitfall, but don't stay there. Push through to grace that says, they, that, that says he loves you, that says he will comfort you, that says he will never leave you nor forsake you. Push through to Jesus. Back to the actual final point, and away from the pitfalls. Praise is always possible. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. We've spoken about the compassion and we've spoken about the comfort. Those are just some of our God's characteristics and who He is. And He's the source of those things. But I love the fact that uh, when Paul begins this passage of Scripture, even in the state that he is in, he says, praise be to the God and Father of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. I love Paul. He's not just in it for the compassion. He's not just in it for the comfort because he knows that the reason why he has any of those things is because God the Father sent his son Jesus. Uh, the reason why he can even uh, be the beneficiary of comfort and compassion is because the Father sent his Son. And so he praises the Father for Jesus first. I found it incredible, incredibly helpful. Even although we sometimes desire and need some other things from God, found it incredibly helpful to praise God for Jesus first because it brings perspective immediately. Brings perspective that God's son died for Vaughan. That God's son love, loves Vaughan. That God's son was for Vaughan when he came and gave his life on the cross. And for some of you uh, today, you don't know God's son. You've heard about him. You might know that he died on the cross, but you've never received him. You've never received the most important gift. You might be needing uh, compassion this morning. You might be needing comfort this morning. But if you get to the end of your life and all you've received is compassion and comfort from God, you haven't received the main thing. Because He sent His Son for you and He sent His Son for me. And what He simply wants us to do is acknowledge that we need Jesus. We need Jesus to forgive our sin because we can't pay the price ourselves. Jesus has done it all, and we don't have to do anything except receive that gift. Ask God to forgive us. And so I wanna encourage you, even as you are needing compassion and comfort to never lose sight of the Father who gave His Son, because He gave Him for you, and He gave Him for me. You know, we praise God in many ways. We praise God in song, obviously, but that's not the only way. We praise Him by our obedience. We praise Him by our generosity. We praise Him by using the gifts and the talents that He's given us. But we praise Him too when we go through a difficult season and rather than throw God out, we simply just uh, throw ourselves at His feet or throw ourselves onto His lap and say, God, I'm still willing to trust You because You so loved me. When we take ourselves in those moments, I believe it's worship. It's worship to turn to, to Him with our broken heart, with our tearful eyes, rather than to turn away from Him. I know sometimes we want to do that. I've been there, done that. But I can I encourage you? There's nobody 
who can comfort us and be there for us like God can. And so this morning, He's wanting to draw near to you. Press into Him. Paul again, so obeying God. He's heading to one town. God says, well, the Holy Spirit says to him, you mustn't go there. So he starts to head towards another town. Holy Spirit says again, Paul, don't go there. Then somebody from Macedonia says to Paul, Paul, come, come here. And Paul knows that God is speaking. He sees us in a dream, in a vision. And Paul goes there. And while he's there, he encounters somebody with an evil spirit and they cast it out. And what happens? He's thrown into prison. What do we find Paul and Silas doing? Midnight, they're praising God. We can always praise God. We're not praising Him for what happened. Don't fall into that trap. It's not Jesus, I'm so grateful for what happened. It's Lord, I don't understand what happened. My heart is broken. I don't know if I'll be able to pick myself up, but I'm coming to you because you're worthy of praise because you showed your love for me already by giving Jesus. And so I wanna encourage us as we close out uh, today to, to be a people of praise in the midst of the storm. Not fickle praise, not praise because, God, because Vaughan says so. Praise because Jesus is always worthy. So I'm gonna ask you, those of you that are in the room and those of you that are online, Maybe you just wanna close your eyes, stay on your couch, maybe grab your spouse's hand if your spouse is with you or your children's hand. Many people have faced many different things over the last couple of months. Some of you are in the thick of it right now. God is wanting you to know that you can be real with Him. He's wanting you to know that you can rely on Him. He's wanting you to know that He is the one that can comfort and his comfort is real. Prayer isn't a small thing. It's always possible to praise him for what he has done as we wait for those things that we are looking to him to do right, right now today. So I'm gonna pray for you. Father, I wanna say thank you for this word. Lord, thank you for this passage of scripture that has uh, been so special to me over many difficult seasons in my life. Thank you for that older man that brought it to me on probably the hardest day of my life that I'd faced up to that point, God. Lord, thank you that you were with me then and you've kept me until today and you'll continue to keep me. Lord, I pray for people today that need your comfort in whatever their trouble is. Lord, I pray that they would wait on you, that they would have their strength renewed. Lord, I pray that they would tell others so that others can be praying for them so that hope will come to them in their own situations. Lord, I pray that uh, they would speak to others so that they can be encouraged with comfort that some of those other people have received from God in years gone by. Father, we ask for that in Jesus' wonderful name. Lord, if there's someone today that has never put their faith in you, I'm speaking to you right now, if that's you. Don't drift through life. There's one anchor. There's one hope. There's many things that might look like hope. But there's only one legitimate hope and His name is Jesus. He's for you. He's not against you. Receive Him today. Then I wanna wanna ask you to stand to your feet because Jesus is always worthy of praise. Always worthy of praise. That Sunday, after uh, we had uh, lost my mom, we walked into church and we sang an old hymn. And I've mentioned it on different occasions. So a hymn that goes something like this, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. City of our God, the holy place. And it goes into a bit of a chorus and it says, And Lord, I wanna lift your name on high. Lord, I wanna thank you for the works you've done in our lives. If you're saved this morning, God has done a work in your life. But for me on that day, the words changed somewhat. 
is Lord, thank you for the work you did in mom's life. If you had not come and made yourself known to her, she would have not known Jesus and she would have not known the healing that heaven ultimately brings. Father God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your comfort. Comfort others today, even as we praise you right now because you're worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and let's praise Jesus because he is just worthy. He gave his life for us.